the president shall have the power. And that's always good if you're the president. You're going to have a power. This power is to fill up all vacancies. Okay, all of them. That's pretty good, too. That may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. And the, the action words in this clause for present purposes are the vacancies have to happen during the recess of the Senate. And the question here is, when do vacancies happen for purposes of Article 2? And um, uh, what is the recess of the Senate? So here's the context. As we know, our political system is functioning great. Uh, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> There have been some problems. The Senate has been a little bit busy. Democrats weren't quite able to get to President Bush's nominees, and uh, Senate Republicans have been a little bit slow at getting to President Obama's. That is to say, nobody can get confirmed for anything, basically. Uh, and it's a tit-for-tat thing, and it is a real problem for the functioning of our government. Now, the one of the ways the president can get around, perhaps, the Senate's refusal to confirm various nominees is to recess appoint them. This has happened with judges, justices of the Supreme Court, lots and lots, General MacArthur, I think, lots and lots of recess appointments have happened. Now, uh, it really came to a head with a series of recess appointments to the NLRB. What happened was the Supreme Court has said that the NLRB has to have three members to have a quorum. No quorum, no NLRB. So they were about to get to the point where they had only two members, and the president had, did not have confirmed nominees to the NLRB. Uh, and so he uh, was going to recess appointment or recess appoint them. As the presidents have expanded their use of the recess appointments, the uh, Congress has made one other maneuver that's relevant to this case, and that is the rule used to be that there had to be that was recognized by the executive branch and the Office of Legal Counsel in particular was that there had to be recesses of a certain period of time, more than three days. So what uh, House Republicans made the Senate do in setting scheduling orders and Senate Democrats had previously done is they decided to have what are so-called pro forma sessions. So if you were going to have a recess for six days, for example, well, ordinarily, that would historically be sufficient to have a recess appointment by the president. So what would happen is that someone would come in to the Senate and say, the Senate shall be now in order. Then they would say, thanks for coming. And that would be the end. That would be the, the session of the Senate. So President Obama said, oh, come on, which is another part of the Constitution, and uh, <laughs> said, I'm going to recess appoint my members of the NLRB, which raised three questions uh, in a case that eventually went to the DC Circuit. And they are, look, the NLRB's member, those vacancies did not happen happen during the vacant, or, or did they happen during the recess of the Senate? They were pre-existing. What is, when the Constitution says the recess, does that mean that there's one? It doesn't say a recess, it says that the recess. And if there's only one, it's probably the intercession recess between sessions of Congress rather than various intra-session recesses. And what's, assuming that the administration were to win those two things, what uh, is a minimum length of a recess to trigger the recess appointments clause? And can the Senate essentially undo the power by having these pro forma sessions? In an opinion by an exceptionally wise and present judge of the D.C. Circuit, um, the uh, Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit said that the administration had violated the recess appointments clause in two different ways. That the we look at the Constitution, it says vacancies that happen during the recess, and these vacancies did not happen during the recess. And when it says the recess, it's talking about the recess. It is not talking about a recess. And therefore, it applies only to uh, intercession, not intracession recesses. And it did, the court found it unnecessary to reach the question of these pro forma uh, sessions and what it is that they mean. Now, this was a development in the law. Uh, it was not an entirely novel development in the law, and it is not a Republican development in the law. I had made these arguments on behalf of Senator Kennedy. Uh, in, during the Bush administration, trying to block Bush administration recess appointment. So it's not an ideological question. But the president had been given relatively free hand before in making these appointments. And the Supreme Court quite sensibly has decided to step into the breach. The administration has been generally losing these cases as courts have, for the first time, taken a very serious look at what the recess appointments clause means. I think that because 
The opponents of the appointments have so many arguments, it will be hard for the administration to pull together five votes. But they have just filed a brief. And to give it its due, it does cite something like 62 billion recess appointments uh, that conform to various parts of its argument over the past few, a couple, a few hundred years. And the Supreme Court may well be faced with the ultimate constitutional question, what do we do with the Constitution if for a long time we've been ignoring the Constitution. Uh, they were not that deterred when, you know, people used to think the Second Amendment was- Cato has some answers about that. Um, you know, the Second Amendment kind of got recognized for the first time in a long time, and that may provide, that may present no obstacle whatsoever, but it does present one of these fantastic things. We've had this Constitution thing for a long time, and you would imagine, particularly because recess appointments come up a lot, that we would have thought about and resolved what this means, but the Supreme Court has never done that. So it presents an, a fantastic question. The consequences could be substantial, both for the political process and the power of the Senate, and also for many hundreds of NLRB adjudications that could be invalidated by the Supreme Court's ruling, which the NLRB can't just rubber stamp now that it has confirmed members, because those were actual proceedings and the proceedings are over. So it's a very interesting question, uh, and uh, we look forward to the Supreme Court's decision.